I want to tell you about a book called The Worry Cure. And The Worry Cure, I'm not recommending the book. I haven't read the book. I don't know the authors. I just know that they reported a study. This study, you might have heard this, and but it's actual, actual research was done. They had people write down things they were worried about, and they tracked this over a long period of time. And then the people reported back those things that actually occurred. And so here's the news. 85% of the things that people worried about never actually happened. Now, if you're a worrier, you go, aha, 15% did. <laughs> so I still need to worry. But here's the, about that 15%. The majority of what did happen, the people reported, it was really not that big of a deal. So it comes down to this, it boils down to this. 97% of what they were worried about was wasted time. Think about that. 97% of what we worry about is wasted time. It uh, reminds me of a quote from a French philosopher. You may have heard this before. It's an it's a old quote. It's about three or 400 years old. My life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. And that's kind of the curse of worrying. You worry about things that never happen. Even more important than what a French philosopher might say about that is what Jesus said about it. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Jesus says this, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. As I read through this, I want you to notice how often Jesus refers to anxiety. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and is tomorrow thrown into the oven, how will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Those are powerful words. I mean, this is really one of those passages that preaches itself. I do want us to kind of explore it and take it apart, but, but I mean, this is a passage that you just read. It's so practical. It's so direct. It just is what it is. Why are you worried? Why are we worried? Why do I worry? Why do we worry about anything? Uh, Jesus lays it out that uh, for several reasons that, that worry makes really no sense and I think we all know that I think we know that worry really doesn't help in any way but yet we still worry so how do we deal with worry well here's what I want us to see in this passage that there is a cure for worry and the cure for worry and anxiety is the pursuit of God's kingdom so when, before I get into this idea of worry and anxiety I, I want to say something about uh, anxiety that is not necessarily the kind of anxiety or worry where we're worrying about something. There, there's an anxiety that comes almost from a, a medical condition that people struggle with. Now, there's, that's not to say that there's nothing that this passage has to say about that kind of anxiety. I think that that kind of anxiety needs this same cure, uh, but sometimes there, there is really a medical component, a physical component that produces uh, anxiety that can't really be explained just by your thought processes or something like that. Uh, but even that anxiety needs to be addressed this same way. But I know there are a lot of people who struggle with anxiety that they can't really explain why that anxiety is there. Uh, but the anxiety that I want to spend most of our time thinking about is the kind of anxiety that's not necessarily caused by a physical defect or a chemical imbalance, but it's just simply caused by our, really, lack of faith, Jesus says. Oh, you of little faith. Now, also, you need to understand that there's a, there is a... Um, a two-sided relationship to anxiety and chemical imbalance. A chemical imbalance can produce anxiety and anxiety can deepen that chemical imbalance. They work together. Depression is the same way. Depression can be caused by a chemical imbalance and depression and the activities that come along with it can actually increase that chemical imbalance. And so there is, that's why I say there is something in here. If you're somebody who, st who struggles with clinical anxiety and, and maybe even you've uh, taken medication 
for that or your own medication now. Understand that what is said here is really the ultimate foundational spiritual truth that will set you free from that, although you may need some medical or psychological help to go along with it. But ultimately the cure for worry and anxiety is the pursuit of God's kingdom. Well, let's take the passage apart. First is uh, the word therefore. Now when we see a, a therefore, we need to ask what it's there for. Uh, that's just good biblical interpretation advice. So what is it there for? What's Jesus pointing us back to? Uh, we talked about this in our last uh, time together in the Sermon on the Mount. He talked about storing up treasures in heaven instead of treasures on earth. So where, you, where are you putting your treasure? And that where your treasure be, there your heart will be also. So uh, Jesus really uh, had us drill down to think about what we do with, with what really matters to us and where we put our treasure and where we spend our time and where we spend our money and where, what we invest our lives into. And it seems that the things on earth, they're so shiny, they look good and the world makes them look really, really attractive. Uh, but we all know, even the people who are giving their whole lives to it, and the Jeff Bezos of the world and, the, and uh, the, the, the folks that are just pursuing with everything they can to grab everything the world has to offer, even they know there's a futility to it. They know they can't hold on to it all. You can't take it with you. There has to be something more. And so Jesus teaches us about that. And then he says that serving two masters is impossible. You can't serve both God and money. He rolls right out of that into this discussion about anxiety. Why? Because one of the reasons we would serve money is we think money can give us what we need and what we want. So it can solve our problems. It can take away anxiety. You know, if I've got enough money, I don't have to worry. You know, if I have enough money, I can solve any problem that might come up. So God and money swapping places with one another can actually lead to anxiety because how much money is enough money? <laughs> There's never enough money. If you have a thousand, you want ten thousand. If you have ten thousand, you want a hundred thousand. If you have a hundred thousand, you want a million. If you have a million, you want ten million. How much money is enough money? It's never enough money because you always see a way that you could be hurt. You you could be that could be taken away from you. So there's never enough money. It leads to anxiety if you serve money. But Jesus says, don't worry about it. Put your treasure in heaven. Put your heart in heaven, and then therefore don't be anxious. So it leads me to. The next phrase, do not be anxious. So this command is given three times in these 10 verses, chapter uh, verse 25, verse 31, and verse 34. And then the word anxious is used three more times. So it's not hard to know what Jesus is talking about in this passage. Like sometimes we come to some passages that are really difficult and it takes a lot of hard work to find out what, what the Bible's actually saying. But here, it's pretty straightforward. Jesus is saying, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious about what? About anything. Don't be anxious about anything. He's going to cover the basic needs here, but Jesus is talking about anxiety and worry. I heard someone say one time, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. And they went on to say, worry and prayer are the same, kind of the same thing, because what do you do in, in worry? In worry, you think about it, you roll it over and overhead, and you talk to yourself about it. Worry and prayer are very similar, except in worry, you're talking to yourself about it. In prayer, you're talking to God about it. And so if you can worry about it, you can, then you have the skill you need to pray about it. Just simply redirect who you're talking to about it. So Jesus is speaking to us here about worry, anxiety. That word anxiety is more inclusive than we think of when we think of the word anxious or anxiety. It, it does include worry. It includes just kind of rolling over and over in your mind all the things that could go wrong, how you might lose this, you might lose that, you might not have this, you might not have that. And so that's what Jesus is speaking about. Uh, what is it that he says not to be anxious about? Well, he says in this passage not to be anxious about what you eat or drink or wear. These are just the basic needs of life. Now think about what we worry about in 21st century American society. Very few of us have ever worried about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, or what we're going to wear. I just bring that up just to remind you that Jesus is speaking to an audience here in the first century that was tempted to worry because they weren't 100% sure where their next meal, where their next drink, where their next set of clothes might come from. So, so it's just a moment for me as I was studying this and thinking, man, how blessed we are. How blessed we are that what I worry about and what people in the first century worried about are so far apart. I have never a day in my life thought, well, I hope I have some clothes to wear tomorrow. 
my mom might have worried about that when I was a kid and I was growing and, you know, your pants are this far above your shoes and all that, but I never worried about it. And, and I was blessed with a mom and dad who they might have had some concerns about how they were going to put food on the table. I never knew about that. And, uh, and I've certainly never worried about, well, where am I going to get my next drink of water from? I mean, I go to a faucet and I turn on the water. And now what, what do we worry about? We worried about, well, what's in that water? Has it been filtered? What kind of filter was it? Is the filter out of date? You know, those are the things we worry about. Where in the first century, Jesus says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. These are the basic needs of life. But we can expand this because the issue here is not, well, do we have food and water and clothing? The issue here is worry. So worry can expand. Just because we have, most of us, the basic needs of our life are fully met and we really cannot foresee a day when uh, we won't have at least something to eat, something to drink, something to wear. That doesn't mean that we uh, are free from this kind of worry. It just kind of uh, goes up the ladder a little bit. So we might worry about what we're going to wear. We worry about what we're going to wear in a different way than they would worry about what they're going to wear in the first century. You know, we go to our closet and we say, I have nothing to wear, which is one of the funniest things you can ever, the clothes full of, closet filled with clothes. We go, well, I just don't have anything to wear. Uh, to this to this wedding or to this occasion or that occasion. I think about it every Sunday morning. What am I going to wear? What did I wear last week? Did I wear that suit coat last week? Did I wear that tie? Did I wear that shirt? You know, what am I going to wear this week? And so there's a little bit of worry there, but I don't think the kind of worry Jesus is talking about. I think the kind of worry that he's talking about, we might ask these questions. Not what shall we wear, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, but how shall we pay these medical bills? It's a big point of worry for some of us how shall we pay for college <laughs> I've got five kids uh, I would be lying if I told you I haven't had at least a little bit of concern about how to pay for college how shall we retire oh man I mean uh, we had the the guy come the the um, guy who works for Godstone he came by and he you know set us all down and he walked through all of our he had appointments with us and we come in and we look at all of our Portfolios, and I was so excited that I should be able to retire by 120. It, uh, as long as I work until I'm 120, everything should be just fine. That's just a joke. The church does a good job taking care of my retirement. But when he lays out those charts and he says, this is how much you're going to need to retire, you go, what, what am I going to do when I'm retired? I mean, that, that's a lot of money uh, that he's encouraging me to have. Um, who shall our children marry? Mm, we worry about that, don't we? Who shall we marry? Maybe some of you are worried about that. Maybe, maybe you say, I'm not worried about who I shall marry. I'm worried about who I did marry. But that's another, <laughs> that's another Bible study. How about this one? How shall we survive COVID? You may think, well, I, I don't think COVID's going to get me. But I bet you have worried about what life will be on the other side of COVID. <clears throat> what will my job be like? What will happen to our church? on the other side of COVID? What will happen to our churches on the other side of COVID? What will happen to our nation? What's happening politically because of COVID? I bet we've all had some worries and concerns because of COVID. So just because we don't worry about food and drink and clothing doesn't mean we don't worry. And these are important things. I mean, these are important questions. These are life-altering uh, life altering consequences are determined by the answers to these questions. It also reminds me of that, that whole conversation of needs versus wants. And, and I think that's an important conversation for us to think about. Uh, what is it that we need and what is it that we want? And that's something that as a kid I, I remember thinking about it in school and our teacher really walking us through needs versus wants. And, um, and it's something good to think about as an adult. What is it that I need? What is it that I want? And then looking around and thanking God that everything I need has been supplied Maybe not everything I want has been supplied, but everything I need has been supplied. But here's what I've learned. is The more I've studied Scripture, the more I've walked with the Lord, the more I've just lived life and seen what God provides, here's what I've learned is that God will supply everything we need. Uh, there's never been a moment where God has not supplied what I've needed. But here's the thing. God also supplies everything I would want if I knew what to want. So God gives me things that I wouldn't even desire for myself that are better for the, than the things that I did desire for myself. Now some of that, we don't re, I don't think we realize until eternity. But by God's grace, he opens our eyes here and we realize what I wanted for myself 
was not what I really wanted. I just thought I wanted it. Think about it this way. What if God had answered every prayer you prayed in your late teens and your early 20s? What would your life be like? Hey, yeah, my life would be like yours. My life would be a mess. I wanted things that I thought I wanted in my 20s, in my, especially in my early 20s, that would have really messed my life up. So thank God that he didn't give me what I thought I wanted, but instead he gave me what I actually wanted if I had known what to want. Well, I have to trust that when I get to eternity, even more so, I'm going to look and say, thank you God for giving me what I wanted, what I really wanted, instead of what I was actually asking for and thought I wanted. So yes, God supplies our needs, but God also supplies our wants. Our just our wanter is off, if you will. It's, it's just it's not tuned to what, because God doesn't, want us to just ba barely get by and you know have a life where we survive but we don't thrive no god's intention for us is to thrive i came to give you life i came to give them life and give them life more abundantly god's desire is for us to have abundant life but our picture of abundant life and god's picture of abundant life are two different things i, I remember somebody came to me one time when i was pastoring in miami and they said pastor will you pray for me I said, sure i'll pray for you how can i pray for you well, I want to be the number one real estate agent in all of South Florida. Will you pray that for me? And I said, well, let me tell you what I'll do. I'll pray that if it's the Lord's will that you'll be successful in real estate. But, but I'm going to pray more than that for you. Because here's the thing. God is not satisfied with only making you the number one real estate agent in all of South Florida. And he said, so you mean he wants me to be the number one real estate agent in all of Florida? I said, no. No, that's way too low of a goal. God wants you to actually be satisfied in Him. And when you are satisfied in Him, it won't matter if you sell one house or a million houses. It won't matter if your portfolio is, is $100 million or you don't even have a, a house in your portfolio. When you find your satisfaction in Him, you will find that there is more there than can ever be offered in any career. So I'm going to pray that God will help you find your joy and your satisfaction in Him because you can never plumb the depths of the joy and fulfillment that you can find in Him. So God gives us not only what we want, but uh, what we need, but what we would want if we knew what to want. Well, Jesus gives us some examples here. He gives us three examples in the next point. Uh, he gives us birds and lilies and Gentiles. Now, birds and lilies are positive examples. He says, think about the birds. And it is interesting to think about. The birds, a bird never worries about its next meal. A bird just goes and gets its next meal. And so a bird just sees a worm and goes and gets it, sees a bug and goes and gets it. Uh, whatever it does to get its meal, it just does it. There's no worry that goes into that bird's mind. And Jesus says, and the Father makes sure that he feeds the birds. Um, and according to his will, according to his plan. And then he says, what about the weeds? I mean, you look at weeds, lilies, but, but weeds, Jesus calls them. It's just grass of the field. Today it's in the field, tomorrow it's in the fire, Jesus says. And God makes sure they are clothed, and Jesus says, with a beauty that not even Solomon could match. So you think about a beautiful field of flowers, and, and we try, it's funny, we try to mimic nature in our design, in our fashion. We try to mimic nature, and we can't quite get close to it. Our art tries to imitate nature, and we can't get it. I mean, we can paint, a uh, starry night is a beautiful painting, but it is nothing like a starry night. It just pales in comparison to a real starry night. And so Jesus says uh, that even the, even the weeds that are going to be thrown in the fire tomorrow are more beautiful than any clothing that, that you could have. And God cares more about you than he does the weeds. God cares more about you than he does the birds. And so he gives us that positive example that, to not worry uh, because of the birds and the lilies. Uh, so it should be Jesus gives these examples so that when you hear a bird singing in the morning, and we have a lot of birds in our city. It's a beautiful city, a lot of birds. So you're going to hear a lot of birds. When you hear that bird, you should be reminded of this. I believe Jesus used birds because they would see a lot of birds. And they would re remember, oh yeah, that bird has what it needs. God has provided. He'll provide for me. You see a flower, you should think. God loves me more than he loves that flower. If he's provided what that flower needs, he'll provide what I need. And then there's a negative example. The negative example is the Gentiles. Now in this case, Gentiles means those who've rejected God. The New Testament uses the word Gentiles in a few different ways. Uh, sometimes it's an ethnic word. 
Here it really refers to the Gentiles, people who don't have a covenant relationship with God, as opposed to the Jewish people who had a covenant relationship with God. You could be a Gentile by ethnicity, and you could have a covenant relationship with God, but Jesus is speaking specifically here of those who don't have a covenant relationship with God. And he says that's what they do. Worry about what they're going to eat. Worry about what they're going to wear. Worry about what they're going to drink. That's what those who don't have a covenant relationship with God do. We who have a covenant relationship with God have an a ironclad guarantee that God will provide us what we need. Never forget that God dropped food from the sky for 40 years to make sure his people had what they needed. Even when they were rebelling against him and they were in the wilderness, they're the ones who put themselves in that situation. Think about our own children. We, we might get on to our own children. We might put our children in timeout. We might spank our kids. We might send them to their room, but we're still going to make sure they have food. We're not going to say, well, you've crossed the line this time. No more food for you. You know, that's not what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to make sure they have what they need, even if they're in trouble. So God is basically as his children on a 40-year, uh, his nation on a 40-year timeout, but still uh, food falls from heaven, water comes out of a rock, and he makes sure that they have what they need. We have a covenant relationship with God where God has promised he will take care of everything we need and he will supply what we need. Well, number five, tomorrow, Jesus says, we'll be anxious for itself. Boy, there is so much truth in that. We worry so much about things that never happen. Uh, we talked about this earlier. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Uh, we take When we worry, we take tomorrow's trouble and put it on today. And we take tomorrow's trouble that may or may not happen and we put it on today. Uh, so many of the challenges we face uh, were challenges we never anticipated. So we worry today about things we might face tomorrow, but then when tomorrow gets here, I mean, there are new challenges that we face. I want you to think, watch this. Watch this happen. This will happen this time around in, in the um, presidential campaign. So when we roll into a presidential campaign, unfortunately, we're just a few, you know, it's just a, like two months away from all the debates and all that stuff gets kicked back up again. It's almost like one ends and another one begins. We never really get out of the campaigning mode. But watch this. Think about this. All of the issues they debate about in those debates, well, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about that? are really not the issues that mark their presidency. Why? Because new things come up. So new things happen in the course of their presidency that, were never, uh, that, that we never anticipated. So I've, always, I've, I've watched this for years, and I remember back the debates, and I like to watch the debates, and I like to see what candidates say. Well, I'm going to handle this problem this way and this problem that way. First few months of their presidency, that's what they deal with, those problems. But those are the last um, problems of the last four years. The problems of the next four years are unknown to them. That's why I believe you should elect a president really based off of his character and or, or, or his problem-solving abilities, not necessarily what he says he'll do about this or that, because those are the last four years' sets of problems. And so um, what we worry about are not really the challenges that we end up facing. And then when you worry about something that is yet to come, only one of two things can happen. Either what we worry about happens or what we worry about doesn't happen. Now, if what we worried about happens, then we have experienced the trauma of that event two times. We experienced it when we worried about it, and we experienced it when we encountered it. If what we worry about does not happen, then we've experienced the trauma of something we never had to experience, and we also have experienced the trauma of whatever trial we actually faced. So if we worry about it on Monday and something unexpected happens on Tuesday, but what we worried about on Monday never really happens, then we've experienced both traumas. But if we just let it go and say, tomorrow is going to present some kind of trial, I don't know what it'll be, the next four years will present some kind of trial, there will come a time when we will tell stories about COVID the way that, uh, the way that people in a generation past told stories about things we didn't know anything about. It's not we weren't interested in them, but it was real to them. It wasn't real to us. It was a history book lesson to us, but it was real to them. There'll come a time when COVID will be that for us. We'll talk with our grandkids, our great grandkids, and we'll say, oh, you wouldn't believe what it was like. You would all, you know, nobody could find toilet paper. The economy just went crazy. You know, we'll tell all these stories and they will pretend to be interested because they love us, but it really won't be that interesting to them. And that's what it'll be. I keep saying I can't wait till the day that COVID-19 is a Wikipedia page. And that's all it is. That'll be a great day. But something else is coming. 
On the other side of COVID-19, there's some other trial. There's some other thing the world has never seen anything like the challenge that we will face on the other side of COVID-19. So we could spend all of our time worrying about what's next, or we could just simply deal with what God has put in front of us in a way that is faithful, a way that honors Him, and we could say whatever comes along next, God's still in control, and we'll deal with it in the same way, one thing at a time as it comes. Well, finally, the cure for anxiety. The cure for anxiety is to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now, at first, this seems like Jesus is saying something out of place. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Tomorrow will worry for itself. Oh, by the way, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. But Jesus connects these two. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All these things you worry about will be taken care of if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So here's what I want you to hear. The cure for worry is not to stop obsessing. Okay? The cure for worry and anxiety is not to stop obsessing. It's to change what you obsess about. So instead of obsessing about who your kid's going to marry or obsessing about what, what is going to happen to your job or how you're going to retire or how you're going to pay for college or what's going to happen with COVID-19 or who's going to be the next president or what's going to happen in the 2022 midterm elections, instead of obsessing about those things, just obsess about the kingdom of God. And in fact, it's, it's almost like worrying about the kingdom of God, not in a negative way, but in a way where that's all we think about. We wake up and we think, how today can I advance the kingdom of God? How can I be a part? What does God want me to do today? How do I be a part of his kingdom today? And we obsess about that. We realize we've been given a gift every day when we wake up. We work for the kingdom of God. We don't know that we'll be given the same gift of another day tomorrow. We might not wake up the next day, but if we do, then we're going to obsess over the kingdom of God. We're going to do what we can do. And here's the thing. We're going to be us, and we're going to let God be God. Uh, when we worry, what we're really doing is trying to do God's job. And we're trying to take... Over. It's not that these things don't need to be addressed. I mean, my goodness, something needs to be done about COVID-19. Something needs to be done about the decline of biblical teaching in our churches. Something needs to be done about who our kids are going to be married. Something needs to be done on and on. Something needs to be done about retirement. Something needs to be done about how we're going to pay for college. But here's what God says. Let me make a deal with you, God says. God says, if you will worry about my kingdom, I will worry about all this stuff you're worried about. Why don't you let me deal with your life why don't you let me become your manager, the manager of your life. I'll make sure all that stuff's taken care of, and you worry about my kingdom. That sounds like a pretty great deal to me. Because here's what I think. I think God can do a lot better with my life than I can. But what does it take? It takes trust. Can I really let this go? What we want to do is we want to say to God, that sounds like a great deal, God. You handle it. But now tell me how you're going to do that. Can you show me? How are you going to do that? You know what, God, send me a plan, maybe not nothing detailed, 20, 30 pages by email. I'll look over it. I'll make some edits, make some changes. I'll send it back to you. We can both agree to it. We sign it. You take care of it. It does not work that way. That's why Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. It takes trusting that God is great and God is good and that God is your Father and my Father and if we'll just let him do what a good and great father will do, then we don't have to worry about it. It is so freeing. It is so freeing to just let go of that. This is an amazing offer God makes to us. Pursue God's kingdom, and God will meet your needs. Imagine that. You worry about my kingdom. I worry about everything you're worried about. That's a pretty good deal. I would encourage us all to take it. Now, there are times where we take it and we take it back and we got to give it back and we got to. This is a constant thing. I think it's an everyday thing. Today, I will pursue the kingdom of God instead of worrying about whatever it is I'm going to worry about. I'll let God take care of the rest. Pursue God's kingdom and God will meet your needs.